Welcome to the Desk of Lady Ada. Hey everybody and welcome to another Desk of Lady Ada in our 10 part series, Maker to Market with Maker IO from DigiKey. And uh, this week is my favorite. I mean, they're all my favorite, like none of them are more favorite than others, but if I was going to pick a favorite, this would be it. This one is all about manufacturing and production. That's right. If I had to pick one that was the most fun to compile, it's this one, uh, a 10 year history of Adafruit uh, will be shown uh, towards the end uh, and more about how we make things. And uh, you know, recently you went to the uh, the White House because of uh, you got an award, a uh, champion of change for the type of company Adafruit is for manufacturing in the U.S. All the ways that we've done stuff together. So this is a really neat overview um, that's focused, of course, on Circuit Playground. So it's really good. It's becoming like a flagship. It's our example. And the last video we did was uh, marketing, and that's where we showed the origins of Circuit Playground from it being an app that was just a, a calculator of sorts, mm -hmm. and it's still the best still um, good. engineering calculator out yes. there. And then we uh, had Circuit Playground, the kids show, and the entire um, group of characters like Adabot and Mo and Hans and all these other cute characters that uh, entertain and educate. And then it goes into how we do things like tutorials and put up code and blog posts and videos and all this stuff. And uh, it's okay. intense. It's, it's about you know two hours. And here it is in 16 seconds. This, was, this is where, I, as I said, you spill all your spaghetti. You told all your secrets. Everything you do, everything that makes Adafruit Adafruit you basically described it. Why you just gave away all of our secrets? Well, when you I mean, do they really secret, when but. you do open source, you're already doing that, and the That's goal true. is to see more people do make uh, to, to be able to make uh, cool things. So that was uh, part seven. So on our on the series here, if you look, it's uh, concept, research, evaluation, design, prototyping, funding, marketing, and now we're up to production. Oh yeah. So with production, oh Lady Ada. Uh, yeah. When people hear about production, there's lots of different things. And uh, we're lucky because we have an example. This is not a theoretical. This isn't a hardware accelerator. It's not um, a Kickstarter or Indiegogo. This or, isn't a rendering. This is a real thing. And so for production, um, we're going to talk about how we actually make Circuit P Playground. And we'll show the finished thing. And we'll go and we'll show all the ways that it's, it's made. Um, we also have examples of just how we make stuff in general and test things. And then instead of just saying, well, you need all this equipment, you need all these things, we'll show you how we used to do it just a few years ago. It was such a tiny amount of time um, and how you can just use uh, a skillet and how uh, we got by with a toaster oven mm -hmm. and how we got by with all sorts of things. So production uh, doesn't necessarily mean that you need equipment. You can outsource, you can do all sorts of other stuff. So um, I wanted to start off with the final product page. Okay. Because this is what it looks like. Circuit Playground Developer Edition. That's where we're at right now. We're going to start at the end? We're going to start at the, the, the end because I think it's like, well, what is this thing? It's an educational board. Mm -hmm. um, here's the, the landing page. Right? These great photos. You know, this went into the marketing talk that we did. We also talked, um, you know, how we get stuff on the site and, and why we put things here or there. And um, you did a bill of materials a long time ago. You know, all this great stuff around. This is animated GIF. Yeah, and I, I like that Circuit Playground has all these different sensors and all these different things that people will be interested in, but it's also a neat thing because you have to test all this stuff and you have to place all these parts. So it's a really neat example. And, um, you know, as we went through the, the journey, we brought out all these photos that we took of it and, uh, you know, here, look at us. Woo. <laughs> so hey. I thought we would look through the lenses of, of Circuit Playground yeah. and talk about how we currently make it and, and more. Mm -hmm. And so um, one of the things that we did not too long ago is uh, here's you at your manufacturing line. Yes. So um, all the way in the back. This is recent because yeah. we got that oven. Yeah, all the way in the back ago. is the stenciler, the two pick and places. Then the oven. Yeah, the uh, conveyor and then the oven, and behind there, which you can't see, is the board loader. We had not gotten our selective solder yeah. machine yet at this photo taking opportunity. Yeah, but you wouldn't be able to see it because it's down the line. I know, but I'm just, this is, yeah, this yeah. Is, uh, and, things are always happening. And just to be clear, you know, one of the things is um, there's lots of different people at Adafruit that operate the machines. Uh, we have some videos with some of them, but we're a pretty big team, 
and uh, just because you don't uh, see Lady Ada on the line uh, right now. I used to change yeah. all the feeders, and I used to she, run the pick and place. Yeah. I, I did my time. Um, the, the old pick and place, which I'll show. I, I learned the manual. I even wrote documentation yeah. on how to use it, and um, I got fairly good yeah. at that old and, pick and place. The new pick and place. By the time we got, had gotten it, we had a whole staff, and so you know they're yeah. trained up, not me. I took the training when we first got it, um, mm -hmm. just in case. But one of the things that we learned. This is more of a management talk. Is you know you have to let go and delegate. Yes. You have to. Um, you'll you can see a glimpse of Adafruit when it was just a few of us, as in like three or four of us. Yeah. And because we were able to hire people, train them, promote from within, they're running all of this. So this is a, a really big group of effort. So thank you everyone uh, who makes Circuit Playground and all of our stuff. Um, we're really happy that we can show um, the production of this. Usually, uh, in fact, I can say this: I've never seen. Um, the types of videos and the types of things that you're about to see because production is usually outsourced, it's hidden, it's secret, it's patent, it's a process, it's all this stuff. Um, we're showing everything. Mm -hmm. Just like we did with the marketing, like you said. That's right. So um, first up, uh, let's... Buckle up. It's yeah, buckle up. This is exciting. Um, so first up, um, these are a stack, stack of PCBs. Yeah. We're so going to start with this. We're going to start with this because this is the beginning. So uh, a few... Weeks ago, I think we did prototyping. You know, we talked about sending out those, the first PCB, you know, I got purple PCBs, you put it together and you get it working. And then after a couple of revisions, you get your finished layout and you know it's good. And you better know it's good because you're about, you're about to spend some bucks. So this is, you know, this is like last stop before, yeah. uh, you know, excitement and production. And then what you do is you're going to get your board panelized. And you know, to be honest, I actually don't panelize the PCB. Instead, what I do is I have my board house do it because they have CAD experts that know exactly how many mouse bites and they're very good at arranging everything and giving enough route distance. So I tell them, I draw, and I actually draw with MS Paint. What are some of the board houses that you like to recommend to people? Because we get asked that all the time. Yeah, I use um, advanced circuits in the US. So they're yeah. really great, they're US one. Um, we've also used Sunshine Circuits. They're in Korea. Okay. They're pretty good. There's actually a lot. At, yeah. You know, there's hundreds. I can't, you So know. for the maker to market people, yeah. I think we've suggested, when you're just getting started, you probably want to try Osh Park. Osh Park is great for prototypes, yeah. and they can do production. Yeah. Um, I think when you're, you know, there's, there's a lot of American board houses. I'm trying to think. Um, Vent Circuits is definitely one of them yeah. that I've also, used. Also, post up the ones that um, y'all suggest yeah. in the comments as well. Um, that way everyone can look at them because everyone has their favorite. Yeah, for, for lots the of most reasons. part, I mean, I don't want to say all board houses are the same because they're not, but for the circuit playground design, it's a two layer board, it's very simple. It's not, um, it doesn't have any IPC requirements or mill spec or anything. It's very basic. Um, you know, for uh, when we make the Arduino PCBs, we have to have the Pantone color matching occur. Yeah. And so, like, that's a situation where you have to, some board houses won't do that. So, you yeah. have to go, you have to find them. Um, you know, when we went to Apex, Expo, there were a lot of board houses there that advertise, you know, that have booths, and that's a good way to yeah. really quickly talk to a whole bunch. By the way, uh, another thing that we did that that's unusual, and we didn't see it, and so therefore we tried to do it, is we when we went to Apex, and it's this huge, huge expo that has all the manufacturing equipment, all the manufacturers. Um, we took a photo of all the booths that were interesting, and we put it up on our blog. So if you go to adafruit.com slash blog, and you search for Apex, you'll see all of our coverage. In fact, one of the interesting things is um, I think we've only gotten a plane like twice over the last few years. Both of the times were to go to Apex. One was in San Diego, one was in Vegas. And you can see the things that we were looking at and we eventually bought them. So there was a Samsung pick and place. There was an oven that we were looking at. Uh, there was lots of things that we were really interested in. And we documented that um, the, the uh, stenciler from Speedline. These are all things that we did research. And so if you're ever thinking about this stuff, you might not need to do the research as much you should, but these are the things that we use. So um, when you have these panelized... Yeah, right, so we got the panel. Yeah, when you have these panelized PCBs... Okay. So um, the, the trick is, you know, uh, depending on your fabrication house, if you're fabricating in-house, it's gonna be different than outdoors, you can talk to your fabrication house and you ask them, well, how big should the panels be? They'll give you a, a, a guess of like, oh, you know, try to make them about 10 inches by 10 inches. Now, there's a maximum size for all the stencils in the machines, which is like 25 inches by 25, but you don't want to actually have your panel that big. Like, making a gigantic panel isn't better um, because there's going to be flex and bowing that occurs, and it's going to be, it just, it just does affect manufacturability. So, I like to keep my boards about like six inches um, wide. 
from the two uh, grips. Remember, you have to have grips on the both sides for the PCB. And then about like 12 inches long. I think that that's a good, I mean, depends on what you're making, of course. But try to panelize like 10 to 20. This is eight. But 10 to 20 boards per panel is, is a good place to start. And okay. you can always. I've, I've got a question on yeah, behalf ask. of the, the world here, too. Ask. Look at that. Ooh, look at me. Ooh. Hold it over into this frame. So, you know, there's always space for some PCBs. And, you know, you can do little things with them. But, you know, once in a while we get asked, well, why don't you have, like, designs inside there? Why wouldn't you always maximize every, like, if there's, like, two centimeters here, why wouldn't you, like, put in a mini trinket or something? Well, I like to keep it simple. Yeah. And, um, you know, the PCB itself is not that expensive. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you are going to pay a little bit more because, for example, it's around PCB. You have to pay as if it was square because that, the, you know, you pay per square inch. But... It, to simplify things and to simplify manufacture, just yeah. one part per panel, I think, is yeah. ideal. And this one has mouth sights. We'll show it on the overhead um, in a bit. Yeah, the want. other thing is we'd have to um, yeah. pick and place all of those additional parts that maybe aren't on that. Yeah, well. it's just confusing. I, like, yeah. I keep it to one, yeah. one part. One, I think one that's product price. per PCB. Um, is usually a good idea. Yeah, so found. then you can, um, when you panelize it, you can use mouse bites or V-score to break it apart. The only time you really want to think about that hard is if it fits into um, an enclosure and there's some parts, you know, you want to make sure that where the mouse bites are or the V-score, you have a little bit of extra space because they're not going to be totally flush. Okay. You know, the, the, I'm going to show that on the overhead just for... Yeah, sure. Just for kicks. Let's see how the overhead looks. Yeah. Right. Okay, so... Not the tester. Yeah. So you can see in between here, there's these little, little. And they're called mouse bites. They're called mouse bites because they look like mouse bites. They look like little mouse bites. They have, um, there's like four or five holes. I can open up the panel later if you want to do a DFM, but there's little holes so that these break apart. So for example, here's a panel which I broke apart earlier, and you see these little tabs. Mm -hmm. You know, with my hand behind it, you can oh, see. Oh, that has a parts on it. There's little tabs. Yeah, this one is a pick and place part, and after it's assembled, you break it apart. And that you just have to, this is one of the things you do. And um, when you do panelize, you know, make sure you have a nice uh, railing on the side. Give yourself like a half a centimeter at least, because the machines, they, they grip. They have a little gripper that grabs the boards. And so you can't have parts all the way to the edge because, the, you know, there's going to be about a quarter centimeter, a half centimeter that is not pick and place available. So definitely, if you're going to spend a little bit of money on the PCB, you might as well. Add, tell the PCB house to add a railing. So you mm -hmm. see it's not edge to edge. There's a little bit of space that's important. Okay. Um, I've definitely talked to fab houses that are like, ah, like, you know, they gave us a board and there's like components up to the edge of all sides. They can't, they can't place all of those. So it's something to think about when you, okay. when you panelize. Might as well get it right. All right. Okay, so, so it's panelization. Yeah, so next up, um, I wanted to show, so there's are on panels and a lot of folks are like, well, how do you how do you stencil it? And so here's a stencil. We have this here. I'll zoom in in a moment. Yeah. But um, you can see that we're putting that panel behind the large set stencil, and uh, when you do that, you can see that where the light goes away, you see how it matches up. Mm -hmm. That's how the stenciler. And we'll get into the stenciler in a minute. But one of the things that's interesting is when we went to Apex, we met the company that. Uh, has a giant laser yes. that lasers through this metal. There's a laser that they use. Um, stencils, not too complicated. Your board house uh, will recommend a stencil house if you don't know one. They often often make stencils as well. Sometimes they'll, they'll ship the PCB plus stencil. A stainless steel stencil is essential for manufacturing. Okay. Um, the thickness of the stencil depends on the apertures and like we get nano coating. Basically, just you know whatever pick in place or stencil stenciler that's going to be used, you have to get a stencil that matches. So we have a 24 by 24 inch stencil. So it's mostly empty because we only use you know like a foot by a foot in the middle. But you know whatever, that's that's fine. You, yeah. it, it's stretched tight, and um, the stencil is very important. Getting a very good stencil will. Imp Increase your yields a lot, so don't cheap out on the stencil. They're only like two hundred to five hundred dollars. So okay. Get a get a good one. Every time you do a board revision, though, you're going to have to update your stencil if if components yeah. move. That's why I try to when I do revisions, I try to not move components. I try to only move traces. Yeah. Oh, okay. Here's a stencil. question for you. Yeah. So how do you manage? the stencils how do you make sure the right stencil is with the right pcb revision um we do revisioning so on the back of each pcb or the front we have a revision code mm -hmm. and um on the circuit playground it's on the back it can show it to you it's on the back and it says b mm -hmm. on the overhead is this little b 
Yeah. The Someone freaked out when they saw we were up to C on a board, and they thought it was copyright. No, it's just the it's just the code. Don't freak out it's on the us. letter Please code. Don't freak out on us. And then we the stencil is matched to it. Yeah. Can I break the fourth wall? But we talked to the camera, so I don't know if it's breaking the fourth it's wall. It's not really. It's no. not really breaking the fourth wall. No. What would it be when I'm just talk when I when I'm pressing pause on the topic of production and just talking to the the people out there? Interlude. In an in interlude. Yeah. Okay. Here's an interlude. Um, so one of the things that comes up from time to time with us as a company is we will do a revision on a board. There is a way that we keep track of it. We put A, B, we're up to C, I think, on one. And the we're up to H. Yeah, we're up to, yeah, we'll eventually be up to R. Okay, and someone's going to assume it means register trademark or something. So um, don't assume the worst in anyone. Assume that maybe the last 10 years of an open source company like Adafruit and assume when people have a really good track record that they're not necessarily, I know everybody eventually is terrible, but um, you know, ass assume the best. Because like I had to deal with a couple emails. It's like, oh, are you, are you closed sourcing stuff now? Is that what the C is for? Your copyright, you know, put a copyright on the board? It's just like, no, like this, we have a revision thing, so you know, chill. So that's my yeah. interlude is like, you know, w one of the things that we do is we keep track of our, um, our GitHub repos, we did a maker business thing yeah. with that. And one of the reasons is if like Lady Ada and Phil ever go away and there's, you know, 10, 100 years in the future as Adafruit is on Mars and, you know, it's a company of 10,000 people, um, you, we want to be able to look back and say, what was the pace of uh, publishing for code? Like we're an open source company and it'll be very difficult for someone to eventually say, well, we don't want to do open source anymore. You will be able to see when it stopped. Yes. So that's one of the things that we do. Okay, interlude's over. Okay, and end of interlude. Let's keep moving. Okay, so um, you do. I do revision codes, and then the revision code is matched to the stencil. And then when you work with a board house, it's really important to keep track of engineering change orders. Um, Woz has an excellent talk. Amanda Wozniak has an excellent talk mm -hmm. about uh, managing engineering change orders with your fab house. I think it's like hardware will cut you is the name yeah. of it. Um, so check out that video. I'm not going to talk about that because I... We do our own engineering change order and revisions in-house, so we don't have a formal process. But as you do more manufacturing, you will need to keep track of yeah. each revision, what changed, you know, get instructions to the fab house, make sure that they're matching up so that if you've updated something to Rev C, they're not still making Rev B. And like all the testers and the stencil and the fabrication, the enclosure all matches up. Okay. So these are things that are not as challenging when you have one product, but it's still quite challenging. Okay. And so one of the things that um, we're going to show now, um, which is going to be pretty cool, is um, this is just a little time lapse. And this is uh, a 180 cam. And you can see all the activity. There's the conveyor of an oven, pick and place, stenciler. And we also have some other uh, videos that show the process. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that's a little difficult to do um, as a as a company that's also a media company, Adafruit, is when you show production, there's so many things going on in the, in the factory itself is such a big deal. And just the immersiveness of it and the noise that's going on and the kind of the energy. So one of the things that we, we, we did, and this is special just for um, this video and the series that we're doing, is we got this really uh, new 360 camera. It isn't this one, it's a newer one that uh, does really high res, or at least better than what was out there before. Yeah. And what we did is we talked to some of the people who do the production with us at Adafruit, and we interviewed them. Mm -hmm. and just, you know, hey, what do you like about this stuff? And tell us how this, this works. So I have to explain a little bit of what's about to happen. So if you go on YouTube right now, there's three videos that you can put on those goggles. Yeah, the cardboard, yeah. like it, the VR yeah, or Yeah, if v you watch it on live. a phone or a tablet that has a gyro, you can look around. And those are available right now. Just released them right before we, we went live. But I have to show them here. So what I did is I um, did a kind of a virtual thing where it's me looking around and zooming in and out. And you just see what I see. Yeah. So this is pretty neat. I've is not it, seen this anyone is the future. do this. Yeah. And I have a feeling eventually manufacturers will do this. Because you want to know how something's made. And you want to maybe meet the people too. Mm -hmm. So um, here we go. Okay. World premiere. Let's take it. Let's see how this works out. Let's Are you ready? Let's see how this goes. Yeah. Take a trip. Yeah. Woo. Okay. 
All right, Lady Ada, we're here and uh, we're in the manufacturing floor at Adafruit. Yes, that's right. And, production, uh, manufacturing, making stuff. Yeah. Yes. And you, hello. Hello. You have some questions about the equipment. Actually, you know the answers, but you're going to ask anyways. I know, but it's more fun that way. Yeah. So I'm here all right. With Noah and Vance, yep. who hey. are on the production manufacturing staff, and we've got this long line. It's it's called a line. Yeah. And this is a line of machinery. And we're going to start uh, piece by piece, and we're going to talk about each one. We're going to start at the beginning. It's a good place to start. Here at the... This is the board loader. Board loader. Yes. Okay, because what does it do? This is a fantastic machine. It's really simple, but the really cool thing is that it saves us a lot of time having to load each board into the machine. You mean the board loader loads boards? I mean to tell you that the board loader, in fact, loads Amazing. boards. It's Amazing. crazy. Okay, yeah. so what happens is that over here, we have a stack of boards. So you see that this is actually like a whole bunch of boards. I get these back and they mm -hmm. they're they're up against this little metal piece here and we got like a 10 but you got, how many boards can you load into this to you can load I, I've actually never counted but you can load a huge stack 50 100. 50 100 and that just boards, exceeds yeah. you so much time because it will load each board yes and then it will pop each one it'll pop each one oh, wait it's happening now it's happening now check this out and it grabs one and it slides it through. Okay. And there are sensors here. There are sensors on this conveyor as well as on this one. And it's connected by a cable called SMEMA, which allows it to recognize, oh, wait, I need to take another board now into the machine because one is already advancing into the next conveyor and so on and so forth. So Can I open this up? Or you, you can open this, okay, up. Let's open um, this up. We'll just hit this and then... Okay, yeah. pick up the safety. Yeah, yeah so these, each one of these board has multiple PCBs. This is like, not only are we loading in a hundred whatever panels, mm -hmm. but each panel is also like 20 PCBs. Yeah. Okay, so then the boards get loaded yes. into... Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Um, there you go. Yeah. Into this machine. That's correct. This Vince, is pick it off. <laughs> yeah, that's right. This is where after it's done loading from the board loader, it goes into here to be sorted individually. Mm -hmm. Now, normally back in the day, we do it painstakingly by hand, Thank God we don't have to do that anymore. So now this machine saves us a lot of time and a lot of effort. So the blades individually through the holes and the stencils will sort of every last piece of the board. And then from there, it'll go into the next machine, which is a picking plate. Okay. This is the SM31. Okay, so after that, it's over, the board's over in the middle, and it's got the solder paste on it. So now it's it's got that sticky, pasty. It's like peanut butter. It's exactly. like this goop yeah. on it. Without the jelly. Without the jelly. <laughs> and then what is this machine doing? This machine. Uh, so we have two pick and place machines in our line, uh, and it, what it's doing is it's taking each part that we have on each PCB. They're very tiny. From each of these reels, these are called feeders. It's taking them through pneumatic suction and placing them very precisely onto each PCB on the panel. And it does it super fast, too. And efficient, too. It's very very efficient. efficient. And yeah. this yeah. one has, what, 10 nozzles? I this think? has 10 nozzles. It's referred to, actually, as the chip shooter. Yeah. I think because it has 10 nozzles in it, and it does it really fast. Yeah, so actually, you'll pick up and place 10 parts at a time. Yes. That's about 10 times as fast as our old pick and place, which would do one part at a time. Yeah. All right, so it's you already did a cool. panel while we were chatting. Uh, right. the next one. And then it goes into the next one. It goes into the next one, where okay. this one loads on a little bit heavier <laughs> than the normal one does. So from there, we have bigger components that would load onto these individual boards. Thank God we don't have to do that by hand as well. Okay, <laughs> and we have two, and it's like, you know, they just do half and half. Exactly, to cut down on time, yeah. and so it can be optimized, it can easily pass the machine easily better and faster. And then how do you actually program in the machine? Like what what do you do like to program it in? Well, it's a... Uh, it's you don't a, have to go through it, just kind of talk yeah, about yeah, it. Yeah, yeah, sure. It's, it's a somewhat um, involved process, but it all happens actually right here at this monitor. And uh, first we get this file, it's kind of a, basically like a blueprint of uh, where all the parts need to go and all of the, it's called the step data. And we tell the machine, okay, you're going to place a resistor here, and a capacitor here, and a header here. And uh, then we optimize it on a different machine, and it bumps down what the machine thinks is going to be the most appropriate way to place all those parts, oh, the okay. fastest way. And then we can kind of tinker with that there. But we, 
we ordinarily trust the machine to yeah. make those good decisions. So it, it, like, and it, what I do is I send you, out of Eagle Cat, I export the centroid data, and uh -huh. then you guys do your magic, you figure out how to get that into the language the machine likes, and then uh, it tells you where to put the feeders, or you tell it where you, what, you know, like how does that work? Well, first it, first it can tell us where to put the feeders, yeah. but if we decide, you know what, it's better to balance the program if we have the uh, tactile button on that machine, then we can tell it where the feeders should go. Okay. And then we can, we have a lot of room to play, and right now it's telling me that okay. this part is out, so I have to see first if it in fact is, but it is not out, so we have to do a little investigating and see that the tape is caught. Oh, so you have, this is, like a, this is a very mechanical process, the it's tape. A, it, yeah, it's also a very mechanical process. It, I always find this machine astounding because though it is so precise, it's not perfect, and just like anything mechanical, it can take just a little bit of tape getting stuck to just grind everything to a halt. It's it reminds amazing. me a little bit, of, you know, the, uh, the, the um, Robocop, it's like, it's like yeah. the, there's a death robot, but like it can't handle stairs. Yeah, yeah, You know, yeah. it's like it can like destroy all of humanity, but it's like, oh no, a one inch gap, I cannot right. handle it. So, yeah. so even though this is very automatic, you still need to have someone checking in, looking for like what is a complaint, running out of parts, feeder gets a little jammed. Absolutely. Okay. And I mean, it's, it, it's, it's not a one person job either. And this is, this whole line really is something that we're finding really uh, flows best with, with around two or three people at all times. Okay. Yeah. yeah. So even without full automation, without you still have to have the human touch. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Alright, so after that? After this, this is a great, uh, great, very simple machine again. This is called the workstation conveyor. And it comes out here, it land, the board will land right here. Uh, this is called our inspection station. We can see here if everything has been placed correctly or not. That's correct. Now we have right a look. So we look over everything to see if all the components and factors are placed correctly. So we can match it with the, with the boards. And then from there, when everything is correct, okay. we just uh, hit the little button and we shoot it right directly Ooh. into the oven. Okay. Yeah. This is where we start cutting. All right. And then down here, yeah. and then tell me what's down here. Down, down here is this the, is the end. Yep, this is the conveyor belt. This is after it goes through the oven, after it's done heating up. It's warm. <laughs> yep, that's out. right. It's kind of hot. But now this is the after. See? Everything's yeah. soldered into place. Everything's fine. Okay. And then these to stack them up. Yep. Get and them we ready. Take them off there. And then from there, we go over to the tester table to make sure that it actually works. So we just take one directly off the panel. There you go. Okay. There you have it. All right. Green means go. go. Yep. Green means okay. good. All right. All right. Thank you Epic. so much, Vance. And thank you, Noah. Yeah. <laughs> Zoo. Okay. So that's, um, that's like part one. Okay. And that was the first part of the line. And uh, then what we did is we did another uh, two videos. And this is around the selective solder machine, which is a relatively new machine. For us. Yeah. You can also get a wave solder, but they're much, much bigger. Selective is what most people use. They're much easier to use. Yeah. And that's what they use for through-hole parts, because all of that before was surface mount. That was yeah. surface mount, now we're on through-hole. So uh, let's move on to the next part. Ready? I'm ready. And the next part of the, the tour for production, and we're here with Noah. Hello. Hey, Vance. Hello. Hey. All right, so uh, what's next on the list? Okay, so we did that line. Remember we did that, um, the stenciler and the picking places in the oven. But those are only good for surface mount components. So we have another lovely machine that we use for through-hole components. And that's called the selective solder machine. And no, are I, you the selective expert. solder machine? No. I am. I'm not the machine. I'd like to think I am. Yeah. This is the machine. Okay. Um, it's the KISS 102 selective solder machine. And it has two pumps. I don't know if you can see that, but... There's two pumps here that can shoot up. We're only using one pump at a time at right now, but um, we shoot molten solder, molten tin, pure tin solder up through these nozzles, and it hits the underside of this board. Where are these? We're making the Ethernet feather wings right now. So see those connectors? Those are not surface mount. They're dual connectors. 
And so if you make a product that uses through-hole connectors, there is a, a secondary process you have to go through, which adds cost, which is why you want to avoid it. But in this case, Ethernet connectors, they really only come in through-hole. So molten yeah. solder is kind of like Terminator 2. It's kind of like T-1000 a little yeah. bit, yeah. Oh, um, very small one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> very tiny T-1000, equally as erratic. Um, so yeah, uh, the whole the whole thing over here is all about trying to just control uh, control the purity of our of our nitrogen, which helps us protect the solder joints, uh, makes them less porous, and gives us less workflow for Vance later on. Yes, okay. that's very helpful because usually when the there's a problem, they would solder and they would join these two joints together. So I would have to manually, painstakingly, have to separate them so we get an easy, even flow. Okay, and this is the screen over here. This is the screen so over here. What's going the on process over here? Screen. Uh, basically, this is right now I'm in the process control tab and I'm ready to put another board in. Can I you have, do that? I can totally do that. I have my pump on right now. I like to keep it hot so that the nozzle doesn't cool off and I can just move on to uh, subsequent boards. So okay. I'll put this board in. You have to bank it off of this stop right here so it goes. Okay, now where you can see the board. I can oh, see and, the board. And this is what this tells you you're registered. It's right in the center. This is my registration, yeah. I, I, I set this as the uh, board's fiducial mark okay. for this process. And it gives me a confidence reading down here telling me, okay, this is roughly, you know, how well I think I can do this right here. Okay. I'm going to, I'm going to adjust it just ever so slightly because I saw that my DRO was reading plus four thousandths in the Y direction. I'm going to reset my fiducial, recheck it. I'm all zeroed out now, which means, and my confidence is much higher. 96. 96. I feel 96% confidence. Yeah. I feel, that's a great level of confidence. So okay. now I'm, I've lifted my nozzle up here. Now we were down for a little bit, so it's a li it's it's cooled off considerably. So what I have to do now is I have to take a titanium probe. It's just a piece of titanium wire, but it's titanium because titanium floats in wire. Uh, sorry, floats in solder and deflects heat better. So I can actually hold on to this and just stick it down into the nozzle. And be careful, I don't want anything to shoot up. Okay, so you cleaned out the nozzle. I've cleaned out the nozzle. And now I'm just going to dress the tip of the nozzle. This is just the brush with a little bit of this flux, Superior 75 flux, dipped onto the, uh, onto the bristles. And I'm just going to very lightly coat the top of the nozzle, flicking it a little bit on the top, just all around. You want to have 360 degrees of coverage. And this is just going to ensure that my wave is nice and stable when I run the run the entire board. But we were down for a bit, so actually the pot is still having to. There's probably some uh, contaminants, some very minor contaminants that are down in that nozzle right now. So That's we fine. have to wait for it to heat up. Once it's uh, all nice and hot, and run our board. Yeah, Check it out. this is an excellent tour. Uh, if we're around when the board's running again. Uh, we'll record it. Yeah. Come this'll, on back. This will be this will be part three. All right. Well, yeah, thank so, you, no. Yeah. Thank you, Vance. Thank you. Selective yeah. like right. solder is interesting because you know people are like, oh, through-hole parts are so much less expensive than surface-mount parts, especially with connectors. But there's this extra labor, so it's something to keep in mind when you're doing your make okay. or manufacture. Let's go over to here. And so these are some of them that are finished. These are not finished. These are have yet to go, to go in. Actually, actually. Okay. yeah, yeah. This is we just assemble all of them first. We just basically stick in this case this uh, giant Ethernet jack into this board. So we're all ready to go. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thanks, folks. Yeah. Sweet. And now. Okay. Yeah. So. I'm um, on my edge of my seat. Yeah. So now the final part of our three part tour of the manufacturing area. All right. Time to get melty. Yeah. Okay. We're here once again with Vance and Noah. And Lady Ada. Okay, so what's going on here? Okay, so we got um, the machine, it's heated up. You have to wait for it to heat up and all the solder is cleaned out and it's ready for the um, solder bubble to appear. I don't know, the T-1000. Yeah, the, 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 the tiny T-1000. The, the selective selectiveness. Okay, <laughs> yes. so Noah, what's going on? 
Well, yes. Um, as Lady Ada was saying, we're finally assembled. This is our Ethernet Featherwing board. And I'm, I'm going to put it in the machine. We're going to get our nozzle up and running. And we're going to take a look at our wave. Okay. Okay. Placed. It's been placed. I'm banking it off of this end stop right here. This can, this can lift up. Uh, but now I know that I'm, that I'm located. I'm going to do my one point check. This allows me to check to make sure that, oh, now it doesn't actually, it's telling me that right now it's not, in fact, good enough. You not need to be like not. super centered. Super centered. Okay. So I'm going to go over here and reset the window. Recheck that. Now my confidence is very high. It's at 87. I'm totally zeroed out on my DRO. So I know that I'm ready to go. Okay. The nozzle is up, and the nozzle is almost, almost has 360 degrees of coverage. So I'm just going to flux it ever so slightly with my little acid brush. There we go. Very lightly around the nozzle. Yeah, because there's no, uh, usually when you solder, the flux is inside of the solder. Yeah. And with this, because it's a fountain, you have to flux it manually. Yes. Okay. Yes. It's something that we usually have to do. We have to dress it usually in between each run. Oh, really? Okay. Yeah. Um, but now I'm ready to go. So I'm going to hit run program. And right now, I can watch it flux pass on our process monitor. So it's fluxing each PCB on the panel. And then it's going to go back and solder each PCB on the panel. Yeah, you can see the little jet. Yeah, it's yeah. super cute. Yeah, that little jet of flux is our, is our drop jet. And it's very, very accurate. Okay, so it's not it's not soldering yet. It's just preparing the board. Right, it's right, right, exactly. Okay. And there's a lot of different leads on each PCB, so the fluxing for this board takes a considerable amount of time. Okay. To be continued. It's almost done. Now it's ready. Oh, it is? Yeah, this is going to be... It's, really? It's about to go. It's about to go. Oh. Yeah. Okay. And here we go. It's okay. checking the fiduciary. Right. Again. Not to be continued. We're just going to keep rolling. We're just rolling. Keep rolling. Very good. Okay. Ah. Look at that. Yeah. Yeah, check it out from this angle. This is great. Touching yeah. and spreading that bubble of solder onto the pads. Uh, trying to kind of fake out the board so that the solder can essentially chase the flux uh, more easily. It's a, it's a somewhat complicated board because we have different lead lengths. So I, I was hoping that this redundancy would kind of correct all of those different things, and, and I found really good results so far. Some companies say think outside the box. <laughs> Fancy now I said think outside the board. Think That's outside right, the, the board. board. All right. Yeah. Well, thank you, folks. We'll yeah. uh, we'll check in later. But thank you for part two of uh, this particular machine tour. All right. Yeah, this is definitely the coolest machine. The sure. hottest machine and the coolest machine. All right. <laughs> Just don't make the other machines feel bad. Don't. Yeah. You have to keep it down. You have to yeah. whisper. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> You're our favorite. Right now. <laughs> and Just right, go check that out. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. Well, no. Just a reminder for that for those. If you want to see them in um, 3D, uh, and you have one of the phones that can, you know, this is just like a Google Cardboardy thing. Yeah. So you can watch th those videos on YouTube. In 3D. Um, and, yeah. You just put your phone in, and then you can look around. And that's how that that's basically like you know you saw the the movement of. Uh, I'll go the other way so you can... Yeah. Yeah, so it was kind of like, like, oh, cool, zooming in and zooming out. You know, that, that's what it was. And on YouTube, there's even just a viewer, even if you don't have a 3D, yeah, a you can circle. scroll and yeah. you can zoom in and out so you yeah. can see different parts of the machine. And on a phone, when you tilt and do stuff, it'll, uh, yeah. it'll, it'll, it'll uh, show. So you can be inside the selector yeah. solder. Okay. So, um, the okay. Next, yeah. so the next part of all this is uh, I wanted to uh, show this. This is one of the ways that we do inspection mm -hmm. we have such great photos of the products that we put online we also use them for comparison there's always automatic ways to do it but you got to have a human 
at some point somewhere checking things out. Yeah, we you know we we have looked at automatic uh, optical inspection AOI, and we decided rather than doing optical inspection, we would do you know one person first article inspector inspection, and then um, uh, full functionality test. So got to do a function test. Yeah, anyway. like but you know some but whenever I talk to fab houses, they say sometimes um, people give them boards to make and they don't have a functional tester which is fascinating to me because I'm like, how do you know it works? Um, but a functional yeah. test will, ca I mean, if it's functionally working, it's almost certainly fine. And as you get to the higher end equipment, you don't need optical inspection as much. Like it's, it's you're not likely to get tombstones. You're more likely to just yeah. not have the right part at all. This is just our opinion um, because, you know, people get their process down. They're probably okay with it. Yeah. Um, so. Uh, do whatever works for you, but this yeah. is what works for us. So this is one of our first circuit playground testers. Yes, this one was made with an other mill, so it's a circuit board mill, that, um, and that's the orangish PCB all the way that way. And uh, I have these little clamps that hold the board in place. And just getting the tester working, you know, it's it, you prototype the tester and then you get a final version. So this is the yeah. prototype of the tester, uh, made with um, a, a Arduino Zero, a Proto Shield, a little TFT, and these clippy clamps. And we actually uh, passed the first 250, 500 boards this way. You know, it's not the yeah. most elegant tester, but it works. And, and making sure that you have, you know, you don't want the tester to be too easy. You want it to make sure that it, it will catch any error that occurs, but you don't want it yeah. to be too difficult either. You don't want it to not pass things that should pass. So getting that narrow road of like, well, what values should be valid is, you know, what variation are you willing to accept on your 3.3 volt power supply or sensor output? So. Um, there's a lot of iteration on that as we go through production. That's a nice thing about me being next to the pick and place is that as boards are coming off, if they're like, hey, these boards didn't pass, I can quickly tell, oh, yeah. the tester needs adjustment or actually there is a manufacturing error. Yeah, one of the things when uh, we talk to people, we always say, you know, our engineer sits 20 feet away from the means of production. That's pretty powerful. 20 feet away from the means of testing, from the means of revisions, from the means of the people that are going to mm -hmm. work on it. So um, we kind of upgraded later, I guess you could say in an upgrade. This is uh, our circuit playground tester. Mm -hmm. And this is the one that we're going to show off uh, here. Uh, we'll do it live in just a moment. But uh, this is just a, a video of it in action. And I'd say the, the thing that is, I think, most interesting mm -hmm. is when you, you do these close-ups of it. And uh, we'll try our best with this, but we had uh, some uh, B-roll, I guess as they call it in the biz, yeah. and uh, how it lights up and, okay. and you can kind of see all the different things. And you know, in the beginning when I said Circuit Playground is interesting because it has all these sensors, all these parts, it's a great example of all of this coming together. It's not just a chip on a board. Mm -hmm. um, the so, breakout testers are pretty easy. This one's a little more challenging. Yeah, this one's a, and so like, eh, you know, you can see it. it it's, so this is a finished tester. Yeah. Um, after we make the prototype tester, then we, we actually go and make a nice rugged, ruggedized one that has these pins and these, you know, spring clips and and it's much more durable. This one is the one that can, you know, take you to 10,000, 100,000 boards. And having test steps is important. The more tests you have, the better off you are. So more tests, more good. Yeah. And, uh, you know, just to emphasize, we always weren't, um, we didn't have the space, the resources, the ability, the people to, to do all this stuff, and so we didn't start out this way. No, um, this is this is actually we haven't even done ruggedized testers till recently, but because yeah. these boards were round, and it's you know tough to get the pogo pins, you know it's hard to make it line up. We actually were kind of forced to go to um, having a, a more formal testing yeah. manufacturing jig made. Yeah. So okay, uh, let's. Um Let's show it off. So this is the overhead with okay. the panels. So but uh, I'll go to the other camera. Um, I got another. You want to show it on overhead first? Or well, whichever. Do? Yeah, either okay. one. Okay. Well, let's. Um, here you go here. Yeah. And That's actually a little bit better. Yeah. So um, this is, yeah, this is the ruggedized tester. And um, this has. I'm going to, I'm oh. going to, yeah, I'm going to, uh, it's fly cam. It's going to fly off. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so this is um, the tester, and so we've got this nice big clamp, and this is the device under test. It's got this nice cutout and these centering pins, and underneath are the pogos, which uh, are very sharp and only come out when the board is pressed down, so you can see very sharp pogo pins. Although they've gotten a little bit 
actually, you know what? They're sharp, but they have little grippies on the end. That's kind of cool. And then um, we plug in this board, and inside is that Arduino Zero, which does the USB testing and stuff, and also you know runs the the testing procedure. Arduinos. Yeah, Arduinos testing, testing Arduinos. Arduinos. Yeah. Caring and, about Arduinos. And then this is the clamp. So once it's clamped down, it's nice and centered. And this is the on-off switch. And then once it's on, um, there's a. Uh, I'll go to the overhead. Print, yeah, the overhead. Will be there. All right, so let's uh, let's zoom in here. Okay, so it's this is the tester, and it's going to tell me when you turn it on. Okay, press the button, and that's the reset button. Mm -hmm. When you press the reset button, it actually flashes test software onto it. I wrote like a test Arduino program, mm -hmm. and it self tests. And I actually have to kind of light it from the side a little bit. And did you hear that beeping sound? Mm -hmm. That was it testing the sound by making the beeper make a beep and then listening with the microphone. So um, okay. once that's done, it will light up a single LED over here and, and it will say, okay, press the button next to that and it'll turn red. Mm, it's a little and, game. Then, and then on the other side, it says, okay, press this button. And when you press that button, it turns blue. So you can make sure that all the LEDs turn blue. And then once that passes, it will um, program in the final firmware, the, uh, the um, Okay, test done. Yeah, the test software that will um, have all the LEDs light up. Woo! And now you know it's working. You're so this done. Is the yeah. test software. Beep, 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 Okay. So this is a test. So once it's done, it actually programs in the final test software as well. Okay. So that's, Epic. that's test. But you, what's cool is that you know the whole process to test takes like 20 seconds. And that's actually mm. really important because the you know, you can manufacture thousands of boards at a time with you know, pick and play, stencil selective, it's all automatic, but the test procedure itself is pretty manual. And you can only really test one board at a time. I mean, even if you have multiple board jig, you still have to test each one. Mm -hmm. So having a fast, thorough, and efficient test is very important. So you use the Arduino Zero with this one? Yep. You use the Pi for other stuff, right? I use the Raspberry Pi for some other boards. It depends. Sometimes yeah, I try to use Arduino Uno whenever possible or Metro because they're okay. easy, low cost. If the tester fails, I can always quickly make another one. Um, the Zero is really great because there's a lot more flash. So to okay. store, you know, because I'm storing the flash test program inside of another board. So um, all that extra memory is great. Also, the Zero has a USB port. And so I use that to test the USB connection to make sure that it enumerates properly. Okay. So all these little things you have to think about, like, okay, well, what if the USB connector isn't good? How would I know? Everything that can go wrong, how will you be able to determine that with test? And as you design the tester, you know, you should damage your board and make sure it doesn't pass test. Okay. Important part of production. Yeah. All right. So um, I feel like we got to uh, a pretty good place with an overview of how we make stuff right now. Yeah. With uh, the machines, some of the folks that make it, mm -hmm. um, some ways that you manage these different things. And then, of course, the, the testing, which you never get to see the testers. Ever, Where? Ever. I've almost never seen. Ever. No one ever talks about testers. that. And so. I'd love to see like, the Raspberry Pi or Beagle mode. That sounds be awesome. Yeah. So, um, one of the things that, uh, you know, we make stuff. And so, our opinion is, is for, this, for us, this is working out. So, when you're deciding. Yeah. yeah. Is I mean, it? Yeah. Okay. So, when you're deciding. Um, you know, onshore, offshore. Um, if you can build up a company that can do it in house, um, it does work for us. We're, um, we're up to like 3,000 products. We do uh, small runs at first and then bigger runs later. We might work with outside partners occasionally. Mm -hmm. um, but for the, for the most part, we really enjoy being able to manage all parts of it and, um, you know, skill up. You know, just because manufacturing was done a certain way doesn't mean it has to be done that way going forward. Mm -hmm. Take the best things and move it forward. So one of the things that uh, back when I was writing at Make, I always was worried that some of the advanced projects mm -hmm. would scare people away. And so we always had a way for someone to come in and also to show that, um, you know, we joke around the, 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 uh, the slogan of Adafruit was going to be, you know, electronics so easy even a girl could do it. Yeah. Yeah. That, that was our joke. Okay. That, uh, Didn't pass that, the... Uh... Well, you came up with it. I thought it was funny, but like... You know, we already had a, enough challenges besides that being like a tagline. So focus um, group didn't, uh, didn't agree. Okay, yeah. the focus group of Mo you. Mosfet the cat didn't uh, yeah. didn't vote on on it. So um, it, I wanted to just show how uh, short of a time ago Adafruit was on one table. Mm -hmm. So you saw how we're maker to market now, how we do production now. 
but a very short time ago. This is like the maker to market of Adafruit. It's very, it's inception. Yeah, we've never really shown this. So this was when, this was all of Adafruit. This is actually all of your money too. This is everything, everything you own and had was in mm -hmm. uh, parts from like DigiKey. And, uh, and it was kits in, in, in bags from the, that you had from the grocery store. And you were about to go to Maker Fair. This is, you packed everything up. And this was uh, Adafruit about uh, seven years ago. Yeah. And this was all of Adafruit. Uh, and you, if you look really close, you can even see the old logo. And it's just like a kiwi fruit on, yeah. the, on the label there. That's all of the kits. That's all of everything that you had. Here is all of the orders. This was... This is one week's worth of orders? Yeah. Yeah. This was all of the orders. Now, we do that in about a minute. You know, we do over a thousand orders a day, like yeah. a couple thousand a day, 30,000 a month. And uh, it wasn't a, um, a company, it was an apartment. And so this is what would have been a living room-ish like thing. Here's the kitchen. You can see uh, some kidding going on. Here's all of the ways. These are all the components I have to buy. Yeah, this was how we managed. Um, this shopping list all of the components and bill of materials. Yeah. And then here I went into your, this was your bedroom, and I said, hey, you know, I'm taking photos of all this. This is going to be a big deal one day. And you gave me the finger. Oh, that's cool. And, uh, and Lots of love. Yeah. And uh, that's, a, that's, that's, that's engineering right there. You were very focused. I think you had, uh, you were ordering stuff on the, the DigiKey side. I was probably time ordering. Yeah, I was ordering like, parts because yeah. until only uh, about two years ago, I was still doing all the purchasing. Yeah. And I think it, I think it's funny because I always thought that what you're doing now ha was going to happen, you know, Adafruit 2016, and I think I know what's going to happen in Adafruit 2020. But um, one of the things it's I like, scary. yeah, um, maybe we'll do a, a, a fortune telling uh, episode. Okay. But um, one of the things I thought that was neat is you never really let the tools that you had or the technologies or pretty much anything stop you from production. Mm -hmm. You were always Doing yeah, it. before I had a pick in place, I did kits. Yeah. I was like, well, I want to get my design out. Okay, well, I'll just make kits that you and can solder yourself. That was all, I mean, I didn't have any manufacturing capability yeah. at the time. I couldn't have afforded to, I mean, it was. it's easier now. Back then, there was, yeah. 10 years ago, there was no easy, there's no it, Osh Park. There it, was no, it was less than 10 years ago. And so yeah. the, uh, the other thing is, just in 2009, you were using a skillet to do assembled production. Mm -hmm. So I dug up a video from 2009, yeah, and we're going to play it. It's a seven-minute video, but here you are, back in the day, showing a reflow controller, because, you know, we didn't have an oven. This was in a, an apartment, a tiny apartment, and uh, I think this is pretty neat. So it's a robo-skillet? So, yeah, let's, okay. let's and, I, and I put a little... Man, you're really pulling out the embarrassing photos and videos. It's not embarrassing at all. I, I, be proud of this, because you did this yourself, and you showed that you can, you can start a, a company like Adafruit, at your kitchen table. Okay. And anyone who's doing this right now can do this too. You can. You can. Be, so, be safe, robo skillet. Yeah, so let's uh, let's tune into this. It's seven minutes, it's worth it. It's really, it's, it's a good video. Okay. So I've got my robotic reflow uh, skillet ready to go. Um, I did a little bit of testing and I imported the data in Excel and I graphed it. It looks like this is gonna be okay. So the next thing is I have to go back and put so, um, solder onto the circuit board so I can solder this little chip here. Um, and only a couple of these little pins have to be soldered. And some people use like, uh, you know, a syringe and they, they really carefully just inject a little bit of solder onto each pin. But because I have a laser cutter, um, I can cut a stencil. And so this is my little circuit board holder and I cut the outline of the circuit board. And then this is capped on. This is a um, heat resistant, uh, pretty strong, thin film. And um, if you look carefully, you can see the little holes match up on the little pads that need to be soldered. So what you do is, this is just like a silk screen. Uh, you put a dab of solder in, you squeegee it over, and then when you lift the capped on off, or the film, uh, little bits of solder are left where they need to be. Um, here's some other examples of previously cut stencils. This one is made out of uh, three mil mylar. This works okay. You can get mylar pretty cheap. It's like ten dollars for uh, a huge amount. But um, the problem is, this is kind of thick, and also the mylar melts a little bit. 
and so you can get really fine cuts. Um, and this is another sheet of Kapton. I write the settings. This was 100 speed, 15 power, 500 hertz um, frequency. And, uh, you know, I try a couple different settings. Um, Kapton comes in these big ass sheets. So, you know, you can see I do a lot of tests on the sheet until I get what I think is, you know, a pretty good setting. And then usually I muck around some more. Here's two sheets of Kapton and a sheet of Mylar. So, let's go with the silk screening. Circuit board's in the nice holder, so it's nicely aligned. Uh, then I take the top off just because it's a little easier to dispense. And I put a blob of solder. That's enough for a couple boards. I'm only going to do a demo right now. I'll make a whole bunch later. And then, you know, you just take a piece of acrylic, just, some, just a square. You can use, a, I guess, like a, a paint scraper or a squeegee, but this works okay. And uh, you just squeegee it over. So you see there's solder in the little holes that were cut out of the stencil. So now when you lift this up, if you look carefully, you can see little deposits of solder. Now, uh, normally you'd have holes for every single pin, but this chip only has 10 pins soldered, so that's why I uh, didn't cut them all out. So you take this stencil off, and then uh, you have your chip. You place your chip. I do it by hand, but most people use tweezers. So now it's placed, and now we're ready to reflow it. Okay, so this is the reflow skillet I built. Uh, this system is not really ideal, but you know this is kind of what I had kicking around the house. So we have um, the thermocouple. This is the thermocouple, and I got the one that has the insulated glass bead, um, so that it can withstand high temperatures because this gets up to like you know almost 250, could possibly get up to 300 degrees Celsius. And I taped it down with Kapton tape. This is the actually the same material that I made the um, silk screen out of. Uh, you know, this is a couple dollars, it's like twenty dollars for a roll, but it's really handy because um, it doesn't melt under high temperatures. It's designed for um, the sort of stuff for attaching um, thermistors and stuff. Okay, time to reflow. So this is the chip. It's got the silk screen solder on it. Put the chip on top. Now I place it in my reflow skillet. Uh, so this skillet has a servo connected to a little wheel, and the wheel turns the temperature knob. That's pretty much how it turns it on and off. It's running open loop, but I calibrated it and to pretty much just run the same every time. So plug in the Arduino and it's got an LCD on it and this is the servo controller. So when it starts up it tells me what the temperature it's reading from the um, sensor and this is approximately what temperature it should be. You know it sort of uh, guesses um, based on the profile published on the Kester data sheet, um, you know, at this t point in time we should be at around 55 degrees and it's around 55, so it's doing okay. Uh, like I said, I calibrated it. So, uh, first we do the warm up. Uh, that's the first part of the curve, and you can see this is slowly turning. Um, uh, and the warm up basically takes the board up to about 120 degrees Celsius, and that just kind of um, gets the board ready for the reflow, uh, you know, as some chemical processes occur at that temperature. Okay, at around 90 seconds um, of warm up, uh, we go into the soak phase. And so this is where uh, basically the skillet is between, you know, 120, 150, maybe up to 180 degrees. And uh, basically it's, uh, it seems like it, the, the solder paste soaks into the joints um, it doesn't quite melt, but this is sort of a preparatory step for the actual reflow. And this happens for about 30 to 60 seconds. Okay, so now we're actually at the reflow phase. And so at this phase, it gets up to around 250 degrees. And you'll see, especially around here, you'll see it suddenly gets very shiny instead of sort of being matte. And that's the solder reflowing into the joints. So you're seeing this is getting up kind of to around 200 degrees. It'll, it'll probably peak at around 220 degrees. So you see how this is now a little shiny. 
that's the uh, solder being reflowed. Finally, after we hit around 220 degrees, uh, we do cool down. So basically, slowly cool down everything. Uh, you know, this sets the solder. Uh, you know, hopefully we didn't char anything. Um, usually it's supposed to cool down a little faster than this, but I don't think it's a really big deal. It cools down a little slower than it ought to. Uh, you can turn a fan on and that helps. Finally, it's cooled down and I take it off the skillet once it's down to, you know, about 80 degrees Celsius so it's not too hot to touch. And you can see here that these pins are nicely soldered, but there's no, um, bridges. It's just a nice, clean, minimal solder joint on these pins here. So now this board's ready to go into the USB Arduino kit. It's a through-hole breadboarding Arduino clone that I made um, about a year ago. And uh, you can get it at Adafruit for about 25 bucks. Okay. Okay. Yeah, fun side note. Um, Young me with I, hot stoves. I had to um, rescue that video. So Adafruit's lasted longer than the video provider we used to use, Blip.tv. Oh, that's right. That was yeah. on Blip. I had, to, I had to grab all those videos. It's gone. So yeah. anyways, that's where we would put videos. And eventually we, uh, we got them out right before they got okay. they went away. Uh, I actually should probably figure out what happened to them. But um, anyways, okay. we got our videos out. So this right. was a while ago. So there's more. So that's you building the company from apartment. Um, yeah, hand place. Hand place hand on a skillet. Skillet. Okay, so uh, a lot of people know, but it's okay to emphasize again. Um, you haven't taken any loans. There's no venture capital. Anytime Adafruit has money, we put it right back into the company. So you were able to do something at a new place. So we moved a block away, and a block away, um, this is another apartment. Um, you got a pick and place. Yay! And you promptly crawled inside the pick and place after you unboxed I it. I could go in the pick and place. Yeah. And uh, this was when uh, we had a little bit more room. And uh, this was the very first hour you had it. I'm and, inside the pick and place. And you were learning how to run the pick and place machine. Mm -hmm. And the other thing that's kind of neat, uh, Bunny stopped by. And uh, Bunny, who just got an EFF Pioneer Award not too long ago, open source laptop, suing the government for all sorts of things yeah, about how you can preserve time. your digital rights. And he stopped by to see this pick and place, and uh, I took you a couple You can see that's the manual on my lap, yeah. and I'm reading it. It's, in, it's kind of half Japanese. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we eventually met the person who made the... We went the, to Japan and met the, the maker. Yeah. Of the, the, who's a maker. The, He's the, like, the, I make yeah. pick and places. And yeah. so it's a, it's a single, it's a very slow pick and place. You know, picks up one part, places Kuchunk. it. But it, Kuchunk. it could do a pretty good job. Yeah. So there's us. And then... Uh, this is an oven kind of like what we used. Um, I don't have any photos of it, but uh, we had a toaster oven eventually, and it had an Arduino stuck to it. And after that, um, we were able to save up enough money, and this is where we actually moved. Um, for the first time, we didn't live inside of Adafruit, and uh, this was our first factory space, and we've already quadrupled our space since then. And uh, this is just uh, a few years ago. As, yeah, in so like, the, as in like a couple years ago. The money that we made from, you know, we used the, the you know, the, when we had the skillet, I was hand placing. And so we, you know, we sold probably a couple thousand products where I would hand place the component. And then after a while, I was like tired of hand placing it. So that's when I the, bought the first pick and place of $30,000 approximately. So we got that small pick and place in us using still a skillet or a reflow of it. And then we moved and we were still in, in the new place. We still were using that old pick and place. But because we were, you know, we finally had 220 power, and we'd been using that kind of sluggish pick and place for a couple of years, um, we made many shields mm -hmm. and breakouts, and that's why, you know, I started with very small sensor breakouts because the pick and place was slow, but it was precise. It could do, you know, accelerometers and sensors and, yeah. and you know, NFC breakouts and stuff. That stuff that you can do with the little pick and place. So we did that until we, you know, basically saved enough money up to buy one of these Samsung pick and places. Yeah, and, and these that's are- it, That's it there, now we have two of them. Yeah, they're about $150,000 a piece. Um, they're expensive, but they're extremely fast, extremely yep. durable. Samsung makes billion of phone, billion e phones. Yeah. You can buy some of the equipment that they use for things like that. Yeah, this is a um, Flex Placer SM4241. Yeah. And then this eventually we got out of the toaster oven 
Yeah. We, what's funny is we bought two, and one of the toaster ovens in our is in our apartment. And it's a so great tester oven. Never had electronics in it, don't worry. But this was uh, the oven we got after that. It's a DM, uh, DDM Novastar. This is from a place in, uh, near Philadelphia. Mm -hmm. They're in Pennsylvania, yep. and they manufacture uh, reflow ovens. And we actually got, this is our first one. This is a yeah. little mini three zone. Yeah. And then we upgraded this to a five zone. Yeah. I don't know if we have a photo of it, but we this this little oven actually did quite it, well. It looks similar, so I'm just Very like, oh, similar. here it is. So the other thing, and this was kind of a, a joke post, but it was a real thing. So after we went to Apex, of course, um, you know, we ordered a speed line and, and, you know, we pretended that I surprised you like, oh, what does the girl engineer get who has everything already? Well, it's a stenciler. <laughs> we got this bow. Yeah. Uh, so the stenciler, we've been hand stenciling until then using a jig and you know, these little metal stencils and it worked really well, but you had to hand align it. And that's pretty good, but you will have yield issues. Um, mm -hmm. You know, hand stenciling or hand aligning stencils, no matter how good you are, you're never really going to get it better than like 95% or 90% yield just because there's human, it's just you're, it's just difficult um, to get the, the tension right and get the line perfectly and you have to squeegee exactly perfectly. So when we went to get a stenciler, rather than what we do with the picking place, we got a low cost, low cost, $30,000 picking place and then upgraded to a hundred, two hundred thousand $200,000 picking place. And then with an oven, we, you know, we got a $100 toaster oven jig and then we upgraded yeah. to um, a four thousand, five thousand dollar oven, and then another one, another one. Yeah. We went straight for like a really good stenciler. Yeah. Like once we were going automatic, we're like, let's get a really good one with vision, and auto detection and auto cleaning. We got a floor model. Yeah. It was about like eighty thousand, hundred thousand dollars. Yeah. We haven't financed any of these. We've decided to pay in full. Cash money. And yeah. So we save up. So. Um, that's but why. We, but you know, we, we we upgrade each part, each machine slowly. Yeah. We got a. You know, we had a. We started with hand placement, then got a simple pick in place and got a better pick in place. Now we have two great pick in places. Start with a toaster oven, then get a nicer, you know, get, start with a skillet and then get a toaster oven, get an oven, three zone, five zone, and now we have a 10 zone. Yeah. So Slow and um, steady. Yeah, so there's more. Um, the next thing, um, here is when we had our manufacturing on a different floor. So we've been taking over different parts of the uh, building that we're in. And here you are doing a live broadcast. Um, this was for an event. Um, you know, let me break the wall again. Let me do an interlude. Interlude. So what's interesting is, you know, we really like to manufacture stuff in the U.S. And Lady Ada here likes to do engineering. And the demand for her to come speak somewhere for just like 10 people, every day there's like 50 emails. And we say, can we do a live stream? Can we do a 360 live stream? Can we record a video and you can play it to the audience? Can we share this? Because we're worried that only like, uh, you know, 10 10 multi-millionaires are only going to see her talking about manufacturing. Wouldn't it be better if it was for everyone? So um, some conferences and some people see the f see this as the future. Mm -hmm. What's the point of the internet and all these high-speed everythings and HD cameras and all this? This was easy for us to do. We're doing this right now, too. So um, if you're ever uh, uh, organizing a conference or something, maybe build in a way to play videos so you can get all sorts of different people to be at your conference, even if they're not physically there. Mm -hmm. I mean, if you think about it, won't we be exploring the galaxy at some point? Won't you need, need to be able to send your message to someone else? What about a global marketplace? Like you can't, it doesn't make sense to fly around the world constantly, it just doesn't. So anyway, um, that's what we do. And we do these factory tours um, via all sorts of uh, amazing modern equipment and high-speed internet access. Um, we also occasionally, um, we had a couple of visitors, and this is kind of neat. So Matthew oh, Bergotti, yeah. uh, we just did a pseudo random. Kip Bradford, who's at MIT, and also a uh, close friend of uh, the company, and also um, someone who worked on Make and Maker Fair quite a bit. Mm -hmm. They visited when we just got our machines, and then um, what we like to do now is also take on one or two kind of outside manufacturing projects. And so recently, we made the Gemma. This is Jessie May. She was in Kidding. Now she's in Community Smart Publishing, so we did Gemma, we manufactured them, and now we manufacture the Arduinos, the real ones, Arduino.cc, the made in the USA ones, and uh, we're very proud of being able to manufacture all sorts of things, including some of the Arduinos now. Yes. So that's kind of cool. And, um, Which that's... you can't do unless you have picket places, selective solder machines, I mean you need yeah. a lot of equipment. And uh, we'll be able to do more because we're adding more equipment. So the selective soldering machine was added. 
couple Samsungs. Yeah, and doing you know it in-house I mean? and being good at it is what lets us make something we can sell for $20 that has all these parts because we know that we're going to have good yield, yeah. that we're going to be able to manufacture quickly. Um, you know, we do in-house manufacturing for the secret program, yeah. but that's a good way to get your skills as well. Like Because we do it in-house, when we do have to go out to a factory to get something manufactured, we will know exactly yeah. how to do it, all the procedures, all the parts. Yeah. Everything will be well documented because we've already gone through it. The, the, you know, there's DFM checks that you can do, but there's no better DFM than actually the M, right? Until you're actually manufacturing. There's no better DFM than the M. Than the M. So, uh, heard it here first. You heard it here. Yeah, so actually going through the manufacturing and um, doing every step and seeing how your product stacks up, that's how you really manufacture. Okay. So this is uh, this is it. This is the production video, Lady Ada. Congratulations. You got all the way through it. You did it. Um, I think we showed a little bit of everything that uh, hasn't hasn't really been seen all in one. So uh, can, can I do some quick tips? Th this is all you. Okay. Because um, I, I did bring a reel because I, I forgot to show off that, you know, this is what the reel looks like. Yeah. So when you get your parts. You want to do it on the overhead? No, no. I, I don't okay. So when you, when you get your parts, you know, they, they can come on reel or they can come on cut tape or they can come on uh, tube or tray. Mm -hmm. And uh, did you guess she has a really cool thing that they kind of invented called the digi reel? So if you're doing a short run, um, we can, can we go to my computer and I'll, I'll show this? Yeah. This is, this is like a powerful run? tip. All right. I'm going to get me out of here. Get out of here. Boop. I'm gone. So, well, I can't spell at Mega, but if I could, so when you go to get for the at Mega 32U4, and then let's um, search for QFN. So, you see how there's like cut tape, did you reel, tape and reel, and tray? So, your board house will almost certainly prefer everything to be on cut tape or uh, tape and reel. You can get parts on bulk, which means it has to be hand placed, that's good for like connectors and stuff. You can get it in tray, and so it comes on like a mechanical, you know, comes in a tray with all the parts. And that's, that's actually not so bad, but I'm, I'm nervous about trays because they can spill very easily. And um, there's a risk of putting them in backwards and stuff, so I, I prefer not to use tray. But you can also get them on tape and reel, and that's best because that way you get a full reel, but you have to buy 4,000 parts. You're going to get the best deal because it comes like one reel, one gigantic reel with all the parts, 4,000, 1,000, at least 250 parts. But if you're doing a small run, you might be like, I'm not going to buy 4,000 of these chips. So you would end up getting a cut tape. And a cut tape is just, you know, you, just how you, when you get prototypes, it's a piece of tape that's been cut. The problem is, is that your manufacturing house doesn't like that. Um, they need to have a bit of space in the beginning and a space on the end. And ideally, it'd be on a reel because that's just how you load into the machine. You sell those feeders. So when you're buying parts, get a digi reel. And it's a little bit more expensive. It's like five bucks more, but it's like super, super worth it because um, you are going to get the leader and the trailer and you will not lose as many parts. But when you, when you do send parts, don't forget to send 10% more. Always get five to 10% more parts because of lossages and you know, they fall out or they, they don't make it to the pick and place or something. The pick and place drops parts sometimes or they get jammed in the feeder. It can happen. It's a mechanical process. So. Um, I always recommend digi reels. Spend the extra couple bucks and get digi reels if you're doing cut tape like quantities. Um, don't cheap out. Don't send your fab house cut tape. They they will they'll smile and say, "Oh, we can deal," but they don't like it. I'm telling you on behalf of them, it, it's very frustrating because then they have to put the leader on and the header on um, for you, and it it's going to be more expensive than just having digi do it. Okay. All right. So with that, Lady Ada. Hot tip. Is maker to market. So. Um, we'll be doing this next week. Next week's topic is on the timeline da, 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 distribution and then support. So we just did production. So now it's about how do you get this out there? How do you Ooh. ship it? How do you get it to retail stores? How do you get it to resellers? How do you do all that stuff? And then eventually, how do you support this? So that'll be the next one and then the one after that. So thank you everyone so much. Hit like, subscribe wherever you're seeing this and more. And uh, thanks for tuning in. Um, we want to do something special for this one. Don't forget the 360 videos are on YouTube right now. And you can explore um, any of the times that you saw the 360 view. So thanks so much. And uh, good work, Lady Ada. Thank you. It's been, it's been a very fast uh, five years. You can, you can go from apartment to factory if, uh, if you're willing to do it. Yep. So 
you were willing to do it. Yeah, and we're, we go in, we buy machinery, we get it installed, and we're running within a week. We are yeah. unstoppable. It's a lot of fun. Okay. So, okay. All right. Well, thank you, everyone. And in closing tonight, we're just going to uh, play the little uh, circuit playground video that we have, just so you know what it is, in case you forgot by now. <laughs> hey, this what, is, what are we working on? What here? is this? Yeah. So anyways, uh, Noah and Pedro, who uh, work at Adafruit, made this video. So it describes what Circuit Playground is really well. All right. See you all next week. All right. See you next week. Circuit Playground is our new all-in-one board aimed towards education and beginners. It features 10 NeoPixel LEDs, a motion sensor, a temperature sensor, mini speaker, sound sensor, a light sensor, two buttons, and a switch. We think it's a great way to practice programming on real hardware with no soldering or sewing required. The onboard Atmega 32U4 processor is Arduino compatible, so you can program it with the Arduino IDE and upload your code via micro USB. It also has a JST connector, so you can plug in a battery to make your projects portable. <laughs>